All right, well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm doing our Ask an Expert today. I am Larry Burke. I am curator of naval aviation here at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, I'm trying to do this without uh, amplification, so if you can't hear me, raise your hand. Uh, I'll try to work on that. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about today is this aircraft behind me, the Curtis N9H. And this is, uh, in many ways, a very revolutionary aircraft. And you look at it and you think, well, what's revolutionary about it? It looks a lot like every other plane. That is actually part of it. So, uh, when the Navy started flying aircraft in 1911, uh, they were flying Wright Flyers and Curtis Flyers, which were the, the open seat pushers. Uh, and in fact, the Curtis, for those of you who are here in the museum, uh, looked very much like our Baldwin Red Devil over here. Um, that's the sort of thing that the Navy was flying uh, from 1911. Um, 1912, 1913, Curtis develops the flying boats. Uh, and we actually have the hull of a Curtis flying boat on this side. Uh, this is an E-model flying boat. The Navy started flying F-models, a little bit more refined. And unfortunately, we only have the hull surviving on this one. But if you can imagine those wings on that hull, you get a sense for what it was. And the hull gives a little bit of a buildup, but what you can't see just looking at it is that the pilot and passenger were still fairly well exposed. The side of the hull is really kind of waist height. Uh, so the pilot, pilot and passenger are still very much sitting out in the open. Um, and what was happening in, in 1916, uh, both the Army and the Navy actually were having a lot of problems with uh, crashes. And part of the problem was they said, well, the pilot is frequently surviving the initial crash, but with the design of the pusher, the engine is right behind his head. And so when it crashes, the engine comes up and hits the pilot, killing him. And the Army and Navy were starting to move away from that. The Army had actually already grounded all of its pushers as training aircraft, um, but the Navy was still resisting. Uh, many of the Navy leadership felt that the, the pusher was still the better aircraft for the Navy. Uh, however, in 1916, uh, the Navy finally, the, the senior aviators finally convinced Navy leadership that the, the headless pushers, like uh, the, the Baldwin that we see over here, were in fact unsafe and succeed in getting all of these grounded. So the Navy is still flying the flying boats, a little bit safer. Um, but they're leading up to this is a recognition that they will need to replace it with the tractor design. And that is what we see here, the Curtis N9. Uh, so Curtis, again, had been developing pusher airplanes and in 1914, uh, in Europe, the, the design tendency is already moving towards the tractor airplane, where the, uh, the propeller pulls the plane through the air instead of pushing it. Um, Curtis recognized this shift, and he wanted to get into it, but he had no experience designing pusher airplanes. So he brought over a designer from Europe, uh, B. Douglas Thomas, from the Sopwith Company, uh, to design tractor airplanes for his uh, plant. And the very first ones he, did, he designed were a Model J and a Model N. And these were very similar airplanes. The main difference was the airfoil, the shape of the curve of the wing. If you look at it in cross-section, they used different wings. Uh, that was the main difference between the two of them. Um, both models had good points but could be improved on. And the Curtis Company ended up combining the best features of both of them into what became the JN. Uh, there was one JN1 that was modified from a J, but there was no JN1 production. Production actually started with the JN2. They built a handful of them. JN3 improved things a bit more until finally they hit the JN4, the Jenny that everyone is familiar with. That was the famous one. Uh, so with that success, um, and again, the Navy is looking at uh, tractor airplanes looking to need one looks at the success of the JN and says basically to Curtis we would like something like that but as a seaplane something that we can fly off of the ocean so it's been said that the N9 is the seaplane version of the Jenny uh, which both is and is not true um, with the designation N Curtis had actually gone back he had developed an N8 based off of the JN4, but again using the N airfoil wing. 
he decided to give it that N designation again. Why it jumped to 8, no one is really certain. There's nothing between the N and the N8. Um, but that was the Army's version. And, and uh, Curtis ended up modifying this to the N9, the seaplane version. And to do this, he did a number of things. First, most obviously, he added the floats. The main float here in the center and some stabilizing wingtip floats under each side. Uh, this obviously so the plane could be flown off the water. This, however, required other changes. Uh, this made the whole plane heavier, so they needed more wingspan. So what he did, and you can actually see it here, this break right here in the top and bottom, those are actually the N8 wings. To modify it, to make it a wider wingspan, Curtis just added a wider center section at the top and five foot sections to the bottom of either side so that they could continue using the N8 assembly jigs and just sort of modify this. So we have a heavier plane, we have a wider wingspan. All of this means that the original 90 horsepower engine was not good enough. So Curtis upgraded it. He gave it a 100 horsepower engine. And this was the original N9 design. There are also some other minor features uh, that he added, some of the differences in the control surfaces, but it's basically a, an N8 with a few differences. Um, it was very quickly found in use that even the 100 horsepower was not enough, it was still underpowered. And that leads us to the N9H, where that uh, 100 horsepower Curtis engine was replaced with a right Hispano. Uh, this is the H. Uh, the Hispano Suiza engine was a, a, a European engine being built under license by the Wright company, hence the Wright Hispano. Um, but whether it was the original Hispano Suiza or the Wright Hispano, uh, the engines were generally known as Hissos. So that's where we get the H in N9H. There was no N9 A, B, C, D, E. It just jumped straight to H. Um, and upgrading the engine caused some other changes. So if you, for instance, you go over and look at our JN4, off in that direction, for those of you who are here, um, you will see that uh, at the nose of the airplane there is actually a, a radiator. This is an inline engine. With the larger engine, the larger uh, right Hispano, um, and the fact that the seaplanes are flying slower, it actually needed a much larger radiator. And rather than expanding the size of the nose radiator, what they did was cover it over and they added this vertical radiator to the top. Uh, so not an especially elegant solution, but a quick and dirty one that, that uh, solved the problem. So um, the other interesting thing is that uh, one of the reasons there were not many JN2s and JN3s made is that the Army pilots who were flying them were discovering that there were some instabilities. Uh, so another revolutionary thing about this airplane is this is actually the first one that was designed with significant input from wind testing. Naval constructor Jerome Hunsicker, who later became very famous uh, in naval aviation designing and, and, uh, and, and naval engineering, um, had set up a wind tunnel up at MIT. He was teaching a program up there. And he actually put the N8 into the wind tunnel and began testing many of these changes to make sure that the aircraft would, in fact, be stable, stable enough for use as a training airplane, because this is what the Navy needed it for. Um, so before I get to the training, I'll, I'll just give you sort of the, uh, the overview, then, of the aircraft design. Curtis ended up building about 100 of these during the First World War. However, once the U.S. got into the war, the needs for these aircraft were much greater than the Curtis company itself could produce. And uh, Curtis ended up turning it over to one of the subsidiary companies, uh, the Burgess Company at Bar Marblehead, Massachusetts. And uh, Burgess ended up making, I have to check my numbers again, uh, it's 400, where are we here? 460 of these through the end of 1918 and 681 total before they shut down the line. So of those nearly 800 aircraft, this is the last one in existence. Uh, okay, so very briefly then, operationally this, as I said, was primarily used as a trainer by the Navy. Uh, it saw service until 1927 in that role. Uh, so obviously was, was very good in that role. A trainer doesn't need to do a lot, 
Uh, so it was a good, solid aircraft design. However, being one of the, uh, the first modern aircraft in the Navy, it also ended up being used for a lot of experimentation. So, for instance, 100 years ago this month, uh, February 13th, a Marine aviator, Captain Francis T. Evans, actually looped the loop for the first time in a seaplane. Not the first time a plane had looped, but the first time a seaplane had looped. And many people at the time thought that that was a physical impossibility because of the extra weight and the drag of the, uh, the main floats. Um, Francis T. Evans actually plays another important role in this story. Uh, he ends up being the commander of what is known as the First Marine Aeronautic Company, uh, which is organized with N9s at the beginning of the war, uh, at the beginning of the U.S. part of the war in the 1917. Uh, and they are actually the first uh, unit to do coastal patrols. They take their N9s, they, they modify them, they put some uh, uh, depth bombs on them, and uh, they start flying out of Cape May, New Jersey. And anyone living in that area, that's where the, uh, uh, the Coast Guard base is now. Um, a couple months later, they actually get sent over to fly similar missions in the Azores. And so uh, the first Marine Aeronautic Company actually can lay claim to being the first fully equipped aeronautical unit to be deployed overseas ready for combat when they arrive. There's a lot of qualifications there, but the Marines are very proud of that. Um, and uh, other things, N9Hs were used by uh, Lawrence Sperry in 1917 uh, when he was developing a system for what became known as the aerial torpedo, uh, kind of a cross between an autonomous drone and a cruise missile. Um, so N9 ended up doing all sorts of things just because it was such a good, steady airplane. Uh, so I just want to wrap things up very quickly with the history of our airplane in particular. Um, so found out recently some more information than what has been known, so some of the uh, staff here may be the first time they're hearing it. Um, our plane was apparently originally sent to Pensacola, uh, I believe it was built by the Curtis Company, so it started life as a regular N9. Um, after about a year in Pensacola, it was transferred to the Great Lakes Naval Training Center to the uh, Aviation Mechanics School, where it was probably a static demonstration tool, something used in teaching. Um, it was there for many years. As I said, N9 served until 1927. In 1930, the uh, training center was looking to get rid of this and a number of other things, offered a package deal to the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. Chicago Museum said, yes, we'll take it, uh, but they put it in storage, and in 1957 they realized, hey, we've never really done anything with this. We have no plans to do anything with it. Uh, let's get rid of it, but before we just throw it out, let's see if the Navy wants it back. Well, the Navy, it turns out, did want it back. Uh, planning was beginning for what would eventually become the National Air and Space Museum, at the time known as the National Air Museum, and the Navy thought this would be an excellent thing uh, to donate to this burgeoning museum. So they agreed to take it back from the Chicago Museum uh, and in 1964 through 66 refinished it. Uh, when it was uh, delivered to the Chicago Museum, it was just the fuselage, bare fuselage and the wings. There was no engine, there were no floats. Uh, so the Navy rebuilt this. Uh, we found a Hispano engine to put in it. They rebuilt it as an N9H, which is probably how it ended its career. Um, and delivered it to the National Air Museum. Uh, and of course, when the, uh, the Hazi Center opened, we put it on display out here. So, questions? Uh, I know we have, had one from the web. We have several um, from our online viewers. Uh, the first from Mario is, is this airplane a monoplane? It is not a monoplane. It is a biplane. It's probably a little bit difficult to see on the webcam. Uh, but there is an upper and lower wing. It's probably easiest to see on the end where you can see the float hanging off of the bottom wing, which is right there. All right, uh, our next two questions are from Gregory Stern. Okay. Uh, where was manufacturing of these aircraft taking place? Were there components all coming from one place? So components were all coming from one place. Uh, Curtis's main factory at this time was in uh, Buffalo, New York, I believe. Um, so the early Curtises were being made there. 
as I said, in 1914, I think, Curtis took over another aircraft manufacturing company, uh, the Burgess Corporation of Marblehead, Massachusetts. And uh, as I said, the vast majority of these aircraft were actually made in Marblehead. Great. Uh our last question is, uh, can you talk a little bit more about how this airplane took off and landed? Okay, so how the airplane took off and landed. Well, as you can see, it is a seaplane. The Navy was, uh, especially at this point, uh, there was sort of an unspoken agreement between the Army and the Navy that if it had wheels, it was an Army plane, and if it had floats or otherwise operated from the water, it was a Navy plane. So this is very definitely a Navy plane. Uh, and you see the main float here in the center, which would have carried the weight of the aircraft. The uh, side floats on the wingtips are really just to keep the plane from tipping over in the water. Um, so it would have started out in the water. Uh, it, might, it might have been on a ramp. The aviators would get in, it would be pushed back. Uh, but then the engine would be started up. It would take off from the water. Uh, it would land on the water. Of course, at this period of time, engines are getting better, but they're still a little bit unreliable, so the ability to land on the water in case your engine cuts out was very important. All right, actually, two more. We've had a couple more come in. Are there any flying today? There are not. Uh, so far as we know, this is the only surviving example. It is not a flying example. Uh, if you come down here and see it yourself, it is, in fact, half finished. We have a uh, clear plastic on the starboard side of the aircraft. You can't really see from here. Uh, but that is why you can kind of see the, the end of the lower wing is brown. That's because that too is covered in clear plastic so you can see the inside. All right, and the real final question this time, uh, when was it active? When was it active? Uh, so they, they first came into service in 1916. And again, this was another sort of revolutionary way uh, that this was a, a, another way that this was a revolutionary airplane. Prior to this, the Navy had ordered airplanes in groups of three at most. In 1916, as I said, with this decision that this would be the new training aircraft and to ground the, the pushers, uh, the Navy ordered 30 of these at once. So this was the first sort of big order. So they start in 1916. They served until 1927 at least. I've seen 1926, I've seen 1928. So there's some uncertainty about that. Uh, but 1927 seems to be the date that most sources agree on. Uh, so it served for a little over 10 years. Great. Thank you very much. And right. thanks and everyone. We had, uh, for one question here. Yes. Okay, so uh, the, just pointed out this is an open cockpit airplane. What did the aviators have to wear to survive? And again, this is, this is considered an enclosed cockpit. Uh, it does not mean it's completely enclosed, but rather than our uh, flying boat over here where it only kind of came up to the waist, uh, here the aviators sat inside, so it was really just their head sticking out the top. Um, and again, most of these would have flown out of uh, Pensacola, warm locations. Um, because of the nature not fly terribly high, so uh, the pilots would not necessarily have worn sort of the big heavy stuff that you might see in some of the World War I aviators wearing. Um, again, primarily training and, as I said, used in patrol, uh, but patrol looking for submarines, so you don't want to get too high. So the aviators probably would have worn a, a leather coat, uh, leather cap, goggles. There is a windshield here, but again, the windshield is uh, that's the term I'm looking for here. Well, small. Uh, so it's not going to completely protect the aviator. And uh, certainly there are times when the aviator might want, especially if they're doing patrol, to lean out and look over the side. And obviously the, uh, the windshield won't protect at that point. Um, so, you know, as I said, probably a, a reasonably heavy coat uh, just to protect from the wind, uh, the leather cap. Um, in uh, at least by 1918, they were using what was known as the Gosport system, which was a way that the instructor could speak through a speaking tube and the, uh, the trainee could hear what was being said. This was a great improvement at the time.